millions of Americans are denied the right to vote because of their color. This law will ensure them the right to vote. The wrong is one which no American in his heart can justify. And that was President Lyndon Johnson talking about the signing of the historic Voting Rights Act. Its 50th anniversary was yesterday, and that landmark legislation aimed to end discrimination at the voters' booth. Unfortunately, especially within the last few years, several red states have tried to roll back some voting rights, and that has impacted minorities in particular in the U.S. Now, my next guest is fighting those efforts, Janae Nelson. She is the Associate Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, and she's kind enough to join us by Skype. Janae, thank you very much for a few minutes. I appreciate it. Sure, thanks for having me. Well, you know what, given the anniversary, uh, let's do a little history lesson for the folks. Talk about um, what it was like pre-1965 um, and, and the need for the Voting Rights Act in the first place. Sure, well, prior to 1965, of course, we had the 15th Amendment. We had a constitutional amendment stating that there could be no discrimination in voting on the basis of race. But southern states and even many northern states completely disregarded that provision of the Constitution, and that required further legislation by Congress to make sure that every American citizen could live out their right to vote and have that unfettered by race or ethnicity or any other discriminatory factor. And there were so many different devices and means by which individuals were kept from the polls and entire communities were disenfranchised. For example, people had to, at times, perform a literacy test, demonstrate that they knew obscure provisions of the Constitution. They were asked to estimate the number of beans in a jar. They were asked to estimate the number of bubbles in a bar of soap. They were given such ridiculous questions as a pretext for the discrimination that was occurring on a rampant level. And it wasn't just that. There were also laws on the books like grandfather clauses, which suggested that if your grandparent wasn't permitted to vote, then you too would not be permitted to vote. And of course, if we look at the history of slavery and other disenfranchisement in this country, most people who would be disenfranchised by a grandfather clause would be African Americans. Their ancestors were unable to vote because of slavery and because of Jim Crow laws, and that was a way of perpetuating that continued subjugation. Should I give an idea, bring it to present day now, and really before this past week with the decisions both from the Supreme Court and also the Georgia case of, of which your, your organization was involved in both, give an idea just how systemic and how many people, if you had to estimate, have been impacted in recent years here um, by some of the rollbacks to voting rights, uh, the mandate to have voter IDs, uh, the crunch, let's say, in, in, uh, in early voting, et cetera. Oh, it's, it's an inestimable number. I can just point to one example in the state of Texas, for example, where we are litigating against, a, uh, against the state that has enacted a photo ID provision that is the most stringent in the country. This is a provision that prior to the Supreme Court narrowing the Voting Rights Act in 2013, the Department of Justice, our federal government, said this law is discriminatory. It will put minorities in a worse position than they already are if you enact it. The Supreme Court uh, disabled that provision in 2013. Within hours of that decision coming out, the state of Texas put this law back in motion and ultimately got it on the books, and we challenged it yet again under another provision of the Voting Rights Act. That law threatened to disenfranchise over 600,000 people just in the state of Texas alone. So when we think about the avalanche of voting restrictions that have occurred in Georgia, in North Carolina, in Alabama, uh, in Texas, and across many other states, Wisconsin, uh, we know that the, the impact is really something that all Americans should be concerned about if they want to ensure that we have an inclusive democracy where all voices are heard and where the process is truly fair and something that we can have faith in in terms of its integrity.
Uh, Janae, what do you say to the argument, um, and I'm sure if the issue came up uh, in last night's debate in Cleveland, um, you would have heard the answer say, hey, what's the big deal about getting a photo ID? It'll stop voter fraud. I mean, who doesn't have a photo ID? Why is this uh, so Herculean to mandate it? Yeah, I love that argument because it, it, it really oversimplifies the issue. And of course, if you just hear that statement, who doesn't have an ID, uh, most of us who will be speaking on TV are in all likelihood in possession of an ID. What we don't realize is that there are a great number of Americans who don't have identification in the form that states are now demanding in order to vote, who don't have a birth certificate, who don't have a federally issued ID, who don't have some of the documentation that would enable them to get the ID even when they are issued for free by the state. Many states require some underlying proof that many others are not in possession of. So it's not as simple as everyone has an ID. You have to have the right form of ID. You have to have access to the documentation to allow you to get the right form of ID. You have to, in many cases, have access to transportation in order to get to some of the government offices that will issue that. Janae, I certainly uh, appreciate a few minutes for you and obviously a major milestone um, uh, for a signature piece of legislation in modern American history. Again, uh, Janae Nelson from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, thank you again. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody, stay with us. When we come back on the other side of the break, we've got some headlines for you. We'll be right back.